Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour une nouvelle conférence virtuelle de l'initiative IA et Société. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new AI and Society virtual talk. For those who don't know me, um, my name is Florian Martin Barreto. Uh, and I'm the director of the AN Society uh, Initiative. I am uh, the University Research Chair in Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa, where I am an Associate Professor of Law, as well as the director of the University's Center for Law, Technology and Society. Uh, today's virtual talk is presented as part of our project on AI for healthy humans and environments, supported by the Alex Trebek Forum for Dialogue. Uh, and that initiative is co-stewarded co by three leading Yorawa research groups, the Center for Law, Technology and Society, the Center for Health, Law, Policy and Ethics, and the Institute for Science, Society and Policy, ISSP. And so today we uh, were delighted to convene you for um, a conversation on the future of public policy for the digital agriculture revolution. And that, that conversation Session will feature uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Kelly Bronson, who is the Canadia, Canadian Research Chair in Science and Society at the University of Ottawa and the research lead at the initiative on AI and environment. She's also a core member of ISSP and a faculty member of CLTS. She will be joined then by Ranveer Chandra, who is the chief scientist of Microsoft Azure Global and a partner researcher at Microsoft Research. You will also hear from Giuliano Toluso, who is the deputy director within the Innovation and Growth Policy Division of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Strategic Policy uh, Branch. And to facilitate this conversation, I'm delighted to present Masha Guganek, who joined us a few weeks ago at the initiative as the Alex Trebek postdoctoral fellow on AI and environment. And so as a reminder, that uh, event will be uh, recorded. So I invite everybody who is not a speaker to switch off their camera uh, and your mic is already uh, switched off. If you have any question, please ask your questions uh, in the conversation. So there is the bubble button at the top of your screen to ask your question, and Masha will take care of uh, read them to our uh, panelists. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Bronson um, for a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian, merci. And bienvenue tout le monde. Um, I'm trying to find that take control button. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it. I um I wanted to thank everyone for coming and I, I want to thank also my or perhaps especially my fellow panelists for agreeing to join me today, my esteemed fellow panelists. I really look forward to what you have to say. Okay, I see the take control button. So I'm gonna try to keep my remarks to under 10 minutes to hopefully shave off a few and give them to my the other panelists. But I did want to make a prefatory remark, and that is I have um, oops. I have put revolution in scare quotes on the first slide because even though a lot of people talk about the application of data analytics and artificial intelligence to food production as radically new, um, uh, as a radically new approach to food production, there is one could question to what extent the this approach uh, departs from prior technologies and a, and a prior approach, as well as the normative valence of of revolution, right, typically has positive connotations. And as we know, um, innovations always bring risks alongside benefits. And I'm not going to pull on either of those or follow either of those lines of inquiry today. But if you're someone who's interested in some of the societal effects, positive and negative, around digitization in agriculture, there's a group of social scientists, myself included, internationally who work on this area. And I'd point you toward this special issue of the Falkeningen Journal of Life Sciences published recently that collects a bunch of this work. But I, I am going to use the time today to, to talk about a project that I have with um, colleagues at UOttawa, a colleague at Carleton University, and hopefully including the new postdoc, Masha Guggenegg. But I first, since I'm the first one on the panel, I thought I would do a, a little bit of exegetical work for those of you here with us today who don't know what digital agriculture is or what big data or AI applied to food production is. 
um, I've pulled the slide from the John Deere website. You know, most of us now are highly aware of data collected into big data sets and used by corporations like Facebook and Google. But we don't think necessarily of agricultural corporations like Monsanto or Bayer Monsanto or John Deere as, as corporations who trade in data, but they do. Um, and so this is from the John Deere website, gives you a sense of the kinds of of uses of data um, on, on farms today. So every John Deere tractor manufacturer today collects um, data from embedded sensors, and that's pictured in this image. You can see remote sensing, you know, um, private and, and public uh, satellites that cl cl collect data on farms, on environment, on weather, as you know. Um, there are satellites or, or stations that collect data embedded right on farms, and then actually not visible on this slide, but on the John Deere website, there are data collected from smart the use of smartphones by farmers, just as example of some of the sources of data that then get pooled. And then uh, computer scientists write algorithms, right? Um, some of them self-learning or machine learning that process those data for insights that are used on the farm or to drive farm behavior decisions about when to seed, when to spray, when to harvest. There's a lot of hope that big data and artificial intelligence applied to agriculture, because it will allow for precise decision making, will allow for precise use of inputs that are either scarce, like water, or harmful, like chemicals. And an example of, of arguments around the sort of um, climate hope for, for big data and AI and ag came recently. The Globe and Mail, our, uh, one of our national newspapers, hosted an event. And actually, Bayer Monsanto or the Climate Corporation were part of this event. And that's a common argument. You know, the, the um, our project, the issue that our project sort of takes up is that... Um, Amidst this hope, there's potentially an issue, and that is the majority of commercially available technologies for collecting data and for making sense of those data or mining them are really biased toward a particular kind of scale of farm, particular kind of farmer. So large farms typically that grow commodity crops, broad acre crops, low value crops like feedstock corn, which is pictured here. There is a whole journal devoted to, to digital agriculture called Precision Agriculture. And the, the second two citations on this slide are pulled from that journal. And there's been a conversation in that journal for years, mostly um, held among agricultural economists, trying to make sense of this bias. And they do so mainly with survey studies of farmers that show that, that things like money really matter, right? This is expensive equipment and only certain size farms can afford this equipment. My research, which I cited in the first as the first two citations there, it takes up a qualitative pr uh, approach, and I interview farmers and I spend time observing far farm environments. And my work really suggests that maybe the bias actually doesn't begin with farmers and with adoption, but actually it um, has something to do with the very design of the tools. So just one example: the commercial big data sets collected, right, by com companies like the John Deere. Um, that then are, are shared with or in conversation with Bayer Monsanto, really only collect data on agronomic crops. So if you're a farmer who grows horticultural crops, right, fruits and vegetables, if you um, are operating a very diverse horticultural environment, these data sets, you're going to come up at a loss, right? Um, you won't have uh, access to data appropriate to your farm. And that's just one example. So what is our project hoping to do? We're hoping to fill this innovation gap or help fill it. And Ranveer will talk about work that, that he does on that's much bigger scale. But so our, our project is hoping to fill this gap or help fill it, targeting innovations for small scale and what I would call sustainable producers. So really diverse farm environments, organic growers, regenerative farmers, and agroecological growers. And I have some sort of sub-objectives there, which I won't dial into just for the sake of time. Um, so what, how are we planning to do this? We've, we've spent a long time thinking about methods, actually, and anyone who's interested to talk later in the question period or outside of about methods, um, I would be happy to do so. But broadly, we're going to use three phage, phases. So one, a scoping phase, uh, second, a development phase, and then third, we're hoping to sort of scale some of the insights we pull from this project. In the scoping phase, we're, we're going to have 
have stalled at organics and regenerative agriculture conferences in Canada, where we're going to use a sticky note challenge and engage farmers in asking them this question and gathering their responses. What would your digital agriculture tool do for you? So part of this scoping is we want to figure out even what kind of tool would be most useful for these farms. Is it an imaging using drones, for example, tool? Is it a sensing technology? For example, most of the soil sensors commercially available look at things like or sense things like nitrogen content. Well, if you're a farmer that doesn't use nitrogen fertilizer, that's not really valuable. But what about a sensor that would that would help you get a sense of uh, carbon sequestration. So you could, for example, access an ecosystem services market. But we need to know what kind of tool might be useful. And we're also going to use surveys, targeted surveys, to get a sense of broad needs and concerns, including concerns farmers might have around data management and privacy. And, there's, and that's a whole other conversation, and some of my work touches on that, concerns farmers have around the collection and use of their personal data. And then we're going to move into a development phase where right on farms, we're going to do design workshops with myself and social scientists, the farmers, but also technologists, data scientists, computer scientists we have on board volunteering to help us at least bring maybe some of these design ideas to the speculative design stage. And then again, we're hoping to scale this project. We take inspiration from a bunch of different methodological traditions, open innovation, participatory technology assessment, which is my area, but actually two papers really influenced the development of our methods in this. One is on using farmer engagement um, to develop a sustainable dairy husbandry system in the Netherlands. But another is that um, uh, sticky note challenge comes from a great project by a roboticist at Georgia Institute for Technology, Carl DeSalvo, called the Growbot Project. And I just wanted to nod to those two papers. Very last, why does it matter? Why does inclusion and diversity, in this case, diversity catering innovations or making sure innovations touch on a diversity of farmers and farm scales and strategies, why does that matter? Well, from a social science perspective, which is, I mean, I have a history in plant science, but I'm now a sociologist, and I would say that it matters for reasons of equity, technological equity. Right. We like the digital divide with Internet and think about homeschooling. Right. It's important that everyone is enabled to engage equally in something like an agricultural, a technology led social transition in agriculture. But it's also that small and diverse farms are still the most numerous farm type in Canada. They may not contribute significantly to GDP, but they're important for the rural fabric of Canadian society. And it's important we don't leave them off the map. And last, these farms are crucial for environmental resilience. Um, and that's really important to me and, and I think the global food system. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kelly. Um, this is a very um, nice overview of your project. Um, uh, so not to lose any more time, I would like to um, uh, invite Ranveer Chandra to come on the stage. I don't see his video yet. Oh, here he is, thank you. Um, so Ranbir is uh, Chief Scientist of Microsoft Azure Global, and um, we'll hear a little bit about his work as well. Yeah, thank you, Marsha, and uh, thank you, Kelly, for inviting me here. It's really nice to be part of the panel in Canada. We've been doing some work in Canada, but today what I'll talk about is a little bit about uh, myself and the work we are doing at Microsoft and what are the challenges, because we believe what we are doing is just scratching the surface, as Kelly mentioned as well. So. Uh, so about myself, I, uh, I'm not an agriculture scientist. I'm a computer scientist. I did my PhD in computer science from Cornell. I joined Microsoft in 2005. So this is my 16th year at uh, Microsoft, most of it in Microsoft research. My background uh, training is as a networking researcher, so developing wireless protocols, thinking of the future of the Internet. And that's what I did for the longest time. And then in 2014 is when I started this project at Microsoft called Farm Beats which is to enable data-driven agriculture. One of the questions you'll ask is, why is a computer sci scientist working in this space in agriculture? Well, I grew up in India, and uh, in India when I grew up, I, I used to spend a lot of time in my grandparents' farm in Bihar. Bihar is one of the states in, in North India. And back then, I did not like anything to do with agriculture. I used to go to these, like if every summer and winter vacation, I would spend with my grandparents. And these farms, they, uh, they, these villages, they did not have any electricity, no toilets. It was far remote. So getting there was a challenge. 
But still, those times that I spent in my grandparents' farms exposed me to a lot of uh, poverty, a lot of primitive forms of agriculture, like hand-based seeding and using bullock-driven tractors and things like that. So that was one of the reasons that even at Microsoft, every five years, I try to start a longer-term project, which also impacts uh, people in the villages in India, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. One of the projects that started was TV White Spaces in 2005. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But with respect to farm beats, the goal of farm beats was to enable data driven agriculture. So when I started this project, actually since 2010, when the idea first came that I wanted to work on this, I went and did lots of interviews, um, even in farms here in the US. I volunteered on farms, talked to farmers. What I realized is that, well, one, I should have been more principled the way Kelly is doing all these surveys, then now I know where to go. But back then I would just go, this was very ad hoc. I would go and talk to lots of farmers, volunteered on the farms worldwide. I went to Africa, I went to India. And what I realized was that farmers, they know a lot about their farm. They have been farming there for several years, decades, if not in some cases, generations. So they know a lot about their farm, yet a lot of decisions they make is based on guesswork. That is, even though they know, like one farmer, he could touch the soil and say what's going on. Another farmer, they would taste the soil and have ideas of what might be going on. Yet, when they have to plant the seeds, when to water, when to uh, apply fertilizer, or when to plant, when to harvest, all of this, this, these decisions are based on guesswork. So that was the concept that we were like, you know what, if we could somehow build technology that would not replace a farmer, but what could augment a farmer's knowledge with data and data-driven insights, it could make the farmer more profitable. It could make the farmer grow more. It could make the farmer practice sustainable agriculture practices. So that's what led to the start of the Farm Beats project. So when we started doing Farm Beats, of course, we realized, you know, if you have to do data-driven farming, this thing of digital farming, the first problem is how do you even get data from the middle of the farm? Most of these farms are far remote. They don't have necessarily great internet connectivity. They, a lot of the data is not even digitized. How would you get a lot of this data to start providing these insights? And the second key challenge was that even though the benefits of data-driven agriculture have been, uh, have been shown, people have talked about, you know, if you could use data-driven agriculture, it would help make the farmer both profitable and, and use sustainable agricultural practices. These technologies have not been adopted primarily because of the cost of these solutions. These solutions are not affordable. That is, the uh, the ROI is not there. What is it, what's the return of investment if a grower goes and tries out these, these digital agriculture practices? So through the work on farm beats, most of the work we did was on bringing down the cost of these digital agriculture solutions. How do you make it affordable? First, what we did was making it easy to gather data. Like for example, one of the problems I mentioned is most of these farms do not have good internet access. If you do not have good access to broadband, how will you get data from the middle of the farm? So one of the, so one of the ways we are solving that problem is using this technology that I mentioned that I started working on in 2005 called TV white spaces. So the problem is the following, right? The farmer's house might have some connectivity. The farm could be a few miles away. In the middle of the farm, there is no internet. When the crop grows, the internet connectivity is gone. So how do you send data from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house? The key idea behind TV white spaces was to use unused TV channels to send and receive data. This is TV you watch using antennas. You know, when you browse through TV, on certain channels you get a transmission, on the other channels all you see is white noise. The technology we had developed was to put a Wi-Fi signal in these empty TV channels in a way that doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an adjacent channel. So you could be watching channel seven at home, on channel eight, we could be sending Wi-Fi signals. And the reason this is so cool for agriculture is that you know TV towers are where people are. You'll have TV towers in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Ottawa. The farms are away from the cities. If you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm, most of the channels will be white noise. And the more noisy channels there are, the more available capacity there is. You're talking of hundreds of megabits per second of capacity in these empty channels. And these signals go really far. Imagine Wi-Fi that can go several miles. So this was one of the technologies that we developed. And similarly, we, we used other things. So because, you know, when people talk of artificial intelligence in agriculture, your AI is only as good as your data. If you don't have good data, your models won't be as good. So it's very important to have this broadband connection, to have 
edge compute. Imagine instead of sending all of that data from the farm to the cloud, you could be doing processing in the farm, enabling more data capture so that you can start sending this data to the cloud. And then one of the other things we did was instead of, so suppose the problem is if you have a farm, the question someone asks is what's the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? If you have to build an accurate map, you would have to put lots and lots of sensors, say a sensor every 10 meters, because you know soil moisture, as you all know, varies from row to row. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage, it'll come in the way of the farmer. So instead, what we used was we, was we used aerial imagery, either from drones or satellites if you don't have it. The other thing we developed was if you don't have drones and you don't get satellite imagery, to do low cost imagery, we're using another technology called helium filled balloons. So we, we built a weatherproof mount that you put on a helium filled balloon where a farmer can put their smartphone with the camera facing down and a battery pack attached to it. And this thing can take images for long periods of the farm. Imagine, so and in some cases like in India and Africa where labor is inexpensive, a farmer could just walk around with the balloon and then we use computer vision algorithms to stitch the imagery. So this is a very low cost way to do imagery. In fact, uh, so uh, when we when we built the system, one of Bill Gates visited a farm where we have this demo close to Microsoft. This is a smallholder farmer. He wrote a blog in Gates Notes where you can see Bill actually carrying this balloon, uh, this balloon around. So then, and the key thing we did is once you get aerial imagery, then we use artificial intelligence so that if you have very few sensors in the farm. We then, wherever you have a sensor and you have the image, we use that to build an AI model. And then we use the AI model to interpolate and predict these values throughout in other parts of the farm. In a research paper we wrote, we showed that this technique can be three times more accurate than existing interpolation schemes that don't use aerial imagery, just use on the ground sensors. So these are all things we did. We, uh, we published papers, we, it was still in research. And then in 2018, uh, I moved over, we started a team to ship Azure Farm Beats as a product. We've taken some of the things I talked about and, and shipped it. In fact, we're building more of the, of the components in the cloud of how do you get large amounts of data? How do you do processing and AI at scale and working with partners to take it to the growers? Like over the last year, we've done partnerships with the USDA, with Lando Lakes, PepsiCo and other companies around FarmBeat so that you can then start gathering large amounts of data and using AI to present useful data to the farmers. The one thing I wanted to mention is now, whatever we've done, our, most of our work is still in the, in the developed world. If we have to really scale these digital agriculture techniques to, to smallholder farmers, we need to make the system even more affordable, more usable in order to, if we have to scale these technologies for smallholder farmers. We are continuing to work in this space. Some of the things that we are doing is, uh, We've developed, a, we're, we're trying to make sensing even more affordable. I'll just talk about one such cool technology that we built recently was, you know, if you have these sensors that you buy right now from, from, from the market, each of these sensors are a few hundred dollars, if not more. So if you're measuring soil moisture or soil electrical conductivity, these sensors are very expensive. And the question was, we asked was, well, you know, a farmer, a smallholder farmer, say someone who farms less than uh, one hectare, less than 2.5 acres, they won't spend a few hundred dollars for a sensor in the farm. Yet many of these farmers, they have a smartphone, even if it is an inexpensive phone. If they have a smartphone, it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, the key idea we developed was if you could measure the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal, that is from the time a signal leaves the phone to another point, the time of flight depends on the permittivity of the material. That is, if the soil is moist, it will take longer to traverse the same distance than if the soil is dry. The key challenge is that this time is in the order of nanoseconds. So we had to then come up with a new, new way to do it. But we wrote a paper on this, on how can you use smartphones to start measuring soil moisture and soil EC. So we showed it to Bill Gates when he visited the farm. And in fact, the title of his Gates Notes blog is Can the Wi-Fi in your phone feed the world? But the vision that, that we have is, you know what, we can, if we can really commoditize sensing, that is a farmer with a smartphone can just go close to soil and start measuring what the soil properties are, we can, if we can democratize sensing, we can truly enable digital agriculture for smallholder farmers. This is one of the inputs, though there are many other barriers, and this is a paper that we are writing right now is, can you, you like, for example, there are many other things that need to be done. People talk about using satellite imagery but satellite imagery 
if, if for smallholder farmers who they do multi cropping, many of these smallholder farmers, like in the same acre, they might be planting up to nine different crops. If you're taking satellite imagery, each pixel might actually correspond to multiple crops. So it makes it very hard for your artificial intelligence algorithms to learn from it. Similarly, uh, language is a barrier with many of these smallholder farmers. People talk about AI and how artificial intelligence you can, uh, with when you uh, when you talk, you can do these things like GPT-3. I don't know if you've heard about this. This is a huge AI supercomputer that uh, that uh, Microsoft is involved in as well, done by the OpenAI uh, organization. But many of these smallholder farmers, they are not technology savvy. They only speak in their local dialect. So then the question is, how do you how do you get them to use any of the technology that we develop? And there are many other problems that need to be addressed. So to summarize where we are is we've addressed a lot of problems for medium to 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 large scale farms. A lot of technology problems still need to be addressed to take these digital agriculture solutions to smallholder farmers. And I'm really excited about uh, potential partnerships with people on this call to help bridge that gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravir. Um, so many interesting cases. Um, I think we could have gone on for another half hour. Um, but in the interest of time, I would like to invite our um, final speaker, Giuliano Toulouso, to share about his work. Um, he's at the de he's the de deputy director within the Innovation and Growth Policy Division of Agriculture and Agri-Foods, um, Agri-Food Canada's um, strategic policy branch. That's a very long um, description. So we look forward to hear your presentation. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kelly and Ottawa U to, uh, for inviting me to sort of give uh, perspectives for my department, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, on this topic of precision agriculture, digital agriculture. Um, so just a little bit of context. Uh, as a department, we've been involved in this space for many, many years from a number of perspectives. We're a science-based department. We have uh, around 400 scientists, so they're involved in uh, precision agriculture, digital agriculture, uh, from a number of perspectives, uh, you know, uh, depending on uh, what sector, primary or uh, processing, uh, greenhouse growing, for example, vertical farming, um, and uh, other aspects as well. Uh, we also provide program support as a department all along the uh, commercialization continuum for the uh, development and growth of companies in this space. And uh, we're also involved in investment attraction and uh, market development because there's been an explosion of interest in uh, precision and digital agriculture and Canada has seen a leader in this space. So many companies and countries uh, are interested in what sort of applications we can have to offer. And then finally, uh, my own group, I uh, manage a group of about five policy analysts, and we sort of look at the socioeconomic considerations uh, in the use of uh, digital agriculture uh, with a particular focus on uh, the adoption and uh, the impacts of non-adoption, as uh, sort of Kelly and Randy have explained, uh, you know, and how that relates to sort of big I innovation concepts like increasing productivity and, and competitiveness of uh, uh, the agriculture sector in Canada, but other questions uh, around equity as well that Kelly has mentioned. So uh, we've done our own studies on adoption over the years uh, and what we found lines up with uh, Kelly and what Randy have uh, 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 have expressed uh, before me that uh, adoption varies. Uh, those types of applications like uh, GPS enabled steering that sort of come bundled when you buy a tractor, those tend to be the most used because the return on investment is sort of baked into those products and uh, you can just turn them on or off and take advantage of that data. Uh, however, uh, there are some variations across Western Canada and Eastern Canada. There, there's some variation in the adoption rate. And then the more precise 
uh, technologies uh, like variable input applications, they tend to be less used because they are more expensive, as has been noted. Uh, they're slower. Uh, the ROI just isn't the, there yet because there hasn't been a critical mass of, of uh, producers who have adopted those technologies. And though we have a pretty good idea of the adoption, uh, the data is still somewhat spotty, especially on the uh, environmental effects. And uh, a lot of these studies tend to be one-offs rather than national studies. Um, so, you know, after we had sort of done this research, uh, Kelly visited the department and we, and we had a, a conversation and, and the subject of, of these inequities came up between the fact that these technologies tended to favor larger farmers uh, in Western Canada as opposed to smaller ones. And, and Kelly mentioned that it, her observations showed that many of these smaller farmers they sort of weren't able to take these off the shelf applications that the big companies were providing that they tended to sort of fiddle around because farmers tend to be fiddlers uh, and they would sort of try and build their own custom applications. So the opportunity came uh, with a, a program that had been announced at that time by the federal government in the budget 2017. The, the government did provide $100 million for Innovation Solutions Canada, which is a, a challenge program with the intent to sort of provide opportunities for small scale businesses, those under 50 uh, employees to uh, uh, access a modest amount of funding uh, to see if they could help develop products and push them along the uh, continuum of commercialization. So a number of departments, including our own, sort of jumped on the chance to participate in, the in this challenge. And because of what I had been discussing with Kelly, uh, we came upon this sort of scaling down precision agriculture challenge. So essentially, it's the, the use case was these these technologies tend to be favored by uh, larger firms and larger operators in the specific geographic regions. Let's see if we can uh, incent uh, developers of products to sort of see if they could sort of scale down the applications so they would be cheaper, more cost effective and attractive to smaller scale operators. Um, so our desired outcome was to see over a number of years, whether we could increase the adoption uh, of precision ag, smart ag technologies among uh, smaller farmers. And then uh, our partners in this challenge, uh, the Industrial Research Assistance Program uh, of uh, the National Research Council, they decided to layer over this, this uh, desire to see a sort of open source requirement for whatever products that were coming through in the challenge. So uh, as far as the, the way the program is designed, there's actually three phases. The first two pages, the one, the first one is uh, this proof of concept. It's essentially a, almost a paper based exercise. Uh, the applicant has six months and we provide up to $150,000 for them to uh, develop their concept for a product or service and uh, see how far they can push it. Uh, the second phase is prototype prototype development where they can access up to a million dollars for a period of two years. And this is actually to con construct a working prototype. There is a third phase after this, which is the sort of assistance to commercialization phase, which uh, I guess provides more funding to sort of get them over the top and get their product in the marketplace. So we had uh, 29 applications. Uh, to our particular challenge and we uh, went through a review and scored the applications. They were in a number of areas. There was uh, uh, making cheaper sensors, for example. There were monitoring proposals for all sorts of crops, horticultural crops, uh, vineyards. Um, there were other applications to try and get some of these uh, tractor-based information and data sharing platforms to make them uh, uh, sort of more democratic and, and sort of uh, easier to access via cell phones, for example. Uh, but the, the two high scoring proposals 
uh, were one uh, actually a company based in Ottawa to develop an Internet of Things uh, smart data hub that would be compatible with any uh, farm management product. So that's sort of democratizing the access uh, via the, a smartphone. Uh, so it was an interface from uh, whatever was collecting the data to a smart hub that could be accessed uh, at lower costs. And then the second project uh, was an AI enabled uh, drone based system for applying pesticides. So those two were awarded funding and they're currently in, in the second phase of the program. So besides that, uh, we're currently shifting our attention to uh, applications for smaller farmers uh, that have a, an impact on sustainability and uh, climate change, because that's a policy focus uh, of the government at large. So over the past few years, we have provided funding through uh, agricultural clean tech program, and then the on-farm adoption component of that programming has focused on precision agriculture, uh, because we have uh, sort of determined that either through fuel savings or reductions in fertilizer use or other inputs, that those uh, applications present the best opportunity to try and uh, uh, reduce greenhouse gas production and uh, the funding for that uh, agricultural clean tech program has recently been renewed as part of the government's uh, broader uh, clean, uh, environmental action plan. Um, so we're currently in the in the process of designing uh, the, the second phase of the program and again there'll be a focus uh, on sort of R&D of applications but also on on-farm adoption. And this will be targeted to a whole range of farms, both uh, large and small and in different environments. And then uh, I'll just highlight another application that we're currently uh, rolling out. It's our uh, Living Labs initiative. This is run by our uh, uh, research side at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And it, it's essentially a cross Canada network of farms, real working farms that our scientists can go and test technologies on. It's not uh, a, a sort of uh, smart farm demonstration farm per se, uh, but it's uh, somewhat along those lines. And uh, uh, the, the beauty of this project is that these technologies get demonstrated, but there's also a connection with our uh, research and analysis division in my own branch, and they do the sort of hardcore economic analysis for the department. So their role is to work with these experiments through the Living Labs program to actually quantify the return on investment and uh, the environmental benefits. And as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, that these are the two of the current weaknesses that we have with some of these technologies. So uh, I'm looking forward to the re results of that partnership. So thanks very much. Thank you, Juliana. Um, this was uh, very interesting in perspective from the government side um, here in Canada. Um, I would like, before I turn to the questions in the chat, um, I would like to ask the panelists if they perhaps have a question that they would ask the respective other panelists if there's something that um, you would like to know more about. I just have a comment that uh, I liked how complimentary all our presentations were with uh, Kelly talking about areas which uh, we should be doing more of the surveys and and Giuliano talked about the opportunities of how we can all work together. The incentives there's uh, there's a government has a plan to get us all to work together. So I thought it was very complimentary. Thank you for putting us all together. <laughs> I would say this exact same thing. It's neat, Giuliano. I don't know um, how many academics or administrators are here, but it's neat to hear a story about how, you know, forward looking uh, government of Canada employees connect with researchers <laughs> and industry, right, to bring forward some, um, bring forward these ideas. So that, that story you told about our conversation and then how that gets, uh, how that got worked into policy, that's like, that will keep me going for another 10 years. Of no, no, no. And 
Yeah, I wish I just had the opportunity for more because I, uh, you know, that was really helpful to me as far as designing. And it was just <laughs> serendipity that these opportunities came together on a conversation. And then, you know, there was a rush to get this challenge idea in place. And we had one that was pretty well fully baked. So. No, it's just great. And listening to Ranveer, all the great work you're doing. And yeah, it's just, it's amazing to try to connect them all. Um, it, it would be, yeah. But I think, Masha, we should just yeah. open it up. Maybe. Yeah, so um, I'm having some technical issues because for some reason I cannot unmute my, my meeting chat. So I'm not sure if I see if there are questions or um, it, I just see my own posts. So I, um, maybe some of you can tell me if there are questions posted. Uh, I, get, I have a question for Ramveer that I okay. can ask while we are trying to figure that out. Uh, so Ramveer, uh, internet access and broadband continues to be a problem, even though the government is pouring considerable amounts of money and extending it. And, and this white space idea sort of intrigues me. But from a technical perspective in Canada, since we're so cabled and uh, as far as our delivery, I mean, are there still sort of, and, and and it's been a transition away from over the air broadcasting, does it still allow for the use of the white space, even though, you know, TV signals aren't delivered as much via that yeah, technology? No, so, yeah, no, so that's the interesting thing, right, Juliano, that even though, so uh, worldwide, uh, the, the part of the spectrum is, reserved for TV by the ITU, uh, the, uh, the International Telecommunication Union. They've, they've reserved it for TV. So even in the US, even though I think the latest count was 6 million or less subscribers are using over-the-air TV, it's still there. That's, that spectrum still is still there to make it affordable so that anyone who wants to watch TV can use antennas to watch TV. Off late, I think a lot of it has picked up because of uh, people trying people using cutting the cable, going with uh, internet-based inter internet content that for any other TV, they'll just use uh, the antennas to watch that TV. So that that spectrum is still being used worldwide for TV broadcasts. And interestingly, in, the, in Canada, the government has made the t use of TV white spaces legal. So it is, yeah. uh, and there are some companies, I think, uh, based out of uh, Ottawa as well, one company called Six Harmonics, which is actually building some of these radios um, to operate in the UHF and VHF TV channels. Yeah, because yeah. we're looking at that as a as a possibility for right. expand extending this problem that, that we're we're still facing. Yeah, because the interesting that uh, there are a few things here, uh, Juliana, about broadband. One is that a large population of the people still do not have connectivity. But one part of the problem is connecting people. The other part of the problem is connecting farms, which is different because in the middle of a farm, you don't have people. Yeah. And and the usually when you talk of connecting people, you talk of delivering broadband speeds is usually 25 megabit per second down, three megabits per second up. The reason is that you're downloading most content. You're watching videos and stuff. Yeah. When you're talking of connectivity in the farm, you need more bandwidth going up. So you need like 25 megabits per second up, three down yeah. because it's mostly things sending data to the cloud. So that requires a new architecture as well. So that's why this is something where, um, and as we all mentioned in different ways for precision agriculture or any such digital agriculture to take off, we need broadband connectivity in the farm. And I think we need, all of us need to be doing more to, to get there. In the US, the FCC has uh, started this FCC USDA Precision Ag Task Force, which is about Trying to the, the goal of that is to come up with both uh, policy changes to enable more adoption of broadband in farms to connect equipment to connect people in the middle of farms to enable precision agriculture. So I think something like that uh, uh, in different parts of the world now the the farms look very different. So the policies might differ as well. But overall, I think we all need both technology, policy, research, everyone to come together to help address this broadband challenge. Thank you so much. Um, so I, um, I, 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 I'm still not uh, sure if people have written in the chat. So I would like if, if somebody has a question, um, maybe just uh, speak I up. See some, I see some questions in chat. Okay, right God. I'm, I'm very sorry. For some reason, I cannot. I, I only see my own <laughs> my own message. So how, Howard Sapers, um, 
I, are you here? Do you want to pose your question? So there's a question by Bill Abbott. So what are the most common types of small farmer decisions that data would support? What to plant, where watering, when to harvest? Are there similar small scale applications for agriculture once the crop is off the field? So supply chain reducing waste. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I could answer and then would love for others to chime in. So yeah. Bill, some of the problems that we look at here are around market linkages as well. So for example, getting to know market prices and so on. So that would just define not only when to harvest, when to store, how long to store, when to take it, when to sell it as well. So all those decisions. And of course, with the logistics companies monitoring the food after harvest to make sure that it is stored in the in the right way so that there's no food waste. That's again something else that and to the points that you raise, I think those are all very important, uh, uh, very important applications as well. In addition to that, around uh, financial inclusion as well, for example, for banks and so on to be connected to the growers. But I would let Kelly, Juliano, and Marsha add to that. Sure. I would say that based on the research I've done so far, again, um, which is mostly small sample sizes for the for asking about technological needs among small and diverse growers. Um, I do survey work, but I have done that with other scale of farmers. It's it's yeah, this, it's similar decisions as to the uh, you know uh, when to when to when to seed for sure or when to harvest. But I also noticed that there are different types of so like what are my ecosystem services for example on my farm and can I quantify that would be one that I I think I've heard recurrently. I, again, I'll, we'll validate this through our kind of the scoping phase of our project, but. You could imagine using um, cost effective U UAV technology or even the weather balloons to just image right some of those ecosystem services on these farms and farmers can use that in their PR right in their marketing with 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 because these are farmers who have more direct access typically to consumers right they don't sell their farms on the um, global market place typically. And so those kinds of marketing opportunities are a real um, selling point in terms of return on investment. And then in terms of like, are the data needs or applications similar once the crop is off the field? I would say sort of, but similar to Ranveer's response and what I just said, these farmers have a different kind of market, right? They operate in a different kind of marketplace typically. And so, you know, um, data, um, data needs around not supply management necessarily, but connecting with consumers, um, I think would be a more of a, a, a data science need or a precision analytics need among these farmers. And But in my view, there are companies, and Ranbir would know better than I, but even in Canada who are feeling that need a bit better, like one of the new super clusters, maybe Giuliano can speak to this, but is on supply chain management and they're dealing with food supply chain um, among other supply ch chains. And there's um, far farmer price book or ag price book is one of the innovations in Canada that that helps farmers connect to market. So, but in my view, the it's the sensing and the AI for food production at the agricultural end that that's a need that's not yet met for small and diverse farms. Giuliano, did you have a response? Yeah, I I mean I don't have a lot to add. I think you've hit the high points. It's uh, again sort of on the input side on on you know, the appropriate time for planting, uh, weather data is increasingly important. Uh, but like you said, Kelly, that uh, sort of at the back end of the process, because uh, larger farms who might have, who might be a part of bigger integrated supply chains, uh, you know, companies like Unilever, they have pretty prescriptive requirements for, you know, if they're selling a sustainable product, for example, then that has to be proved all along the chain and that trickles down to farmers and uh, that level of sort of data has to be supplied and aggregated there. So that at, at some point that might trickle down to smaller farmers, but uh, as my co-presenter said right now, it's it's mostly on the sort of basic decisions on uh, on production. Okay, so um, I am very sorry that uh, I have to rely on my <laughs> panelists to 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 read the questions, but I do see Howard Sapers pop up um, frequently, and uh, um, I don't know if he can unmute himself. There's another question, Masha, from Sarah Ann Brazo. Okay. Um, how to apply this, um, like I guess big data AI to urban setting, urban agriculture, citizen-based farming, which is such a neat question. And actually, 
Masha in Germany has done a bunch of work on vertical farming. <laughs> but what I'd like to hear from, yeah, my fellow panelists. Yeah, I guess I was gonna also um, sort of reply in the vertical farming context because we have talked to vertical farming startups and and it's very important because of the system sort of integration in that particular model. I'm sure Masha could probably add, given her experience, that uh, they're very sort of technologically advanced with systems for watering, fertilizing, temperature control. Um, so you know, those systems for monitoring data become very important because, you know, it's all about the turnover of these crops as fast as possible. So, uh, yeah. So that that particular niche of agriculture, which is still developing, at, at least in Canada, is extremely data driven. And, and, you know, a lot of the investment money comes from the tech side. So they're they're very used to these systems and, and comfortable with them. Ranveer, did you have anything to add? Yeah, no, so and uh, to both your points, and Masha, you know a lot more about this, but the small farmers that we work with, of course, the hydroponics, the vertical farming people, they've, they've been using technology and they want to use more. And I think my, my gut feeling here is that a lot of innovations that we see in agriculture, the use of AI, uh, some of the more advanced models will first come up in these vertical farming scenarios because it's such a controlled environment. You can change a lot of things. You can study them. You can apply reinforcement learning or the future iterations of that to model a plant better. So that way, it's a very exciting field for computer scientists to go and explore the plant and the plant growth. But on the other hand, the other thing I think which Sarah might be asking is the farms close to cities. Like we did these deployments with the small farms close to cities. They sell vegetables. They, they bring uh, food to farmers markets. And I think they need technology a lot. When we talk to them, we realize that these are farmers who are passionate about agriculture, but they don't use technology. They don't necessarily have connectivity challenges, but they are not very well off. To get technology to them, you need to make it affordable. You need to relate to them. They are not, you can't just give them data. You need to make this data interpret, interpretable for these growers, but the opportunities are huge. The problems are slightly different because they are usually in horticulture, growing crops close to cities, but I think that's a very important community that we should be thinking about as well. Well, Ranveer, that's precisely the farmer that I'm targeting in my <laughs> project. Yes. So those those horticultural and diverse farmers who exist uh, largely around in green belts around around um, cities in Ontario and Quebec. So because, mm -hmm. as you say, like these are uh, farmers who are highly innovative and often quite young, actually, and diverse in terms of like gender diversity and, you know, um, really progressive farms. And, and it's not that they don't want to incorporate some of these emergent tools. But I found that there's a bias in the design of the tools that, that, you know, the sensing, for example, doesn't necessarily speak to those farms. The data sets don't exist for those farms. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's precisely the gap I'm hoping to fill. Awesome. <laughs> OK, so we have uh, about five minutes left and I would like to um, ask if there is maybe another question. Um, um, Howard Sabres, maybe. Uh, he says he doesn't well, have a Howard question. Says after. Yeah, Howard yeah. says he doesn't have a question. No, he That's, doesn't? All right, know. it keeps popping up. That's funny. So any other question uh, that there's, you see? There's two that deal with um, data ownership and data trust. And so we could sort of lump that together, if that's OK, in the interest of time. And how do how does Farm Beats in particular, or how do how do we think about this issue of uh, data trust issues and data governance? Ranveer, do you want to? Right. Yeah, I could take the Farm Beats scenario there. So. There with Microsoft, we are so data governance, of course, is a very important problem. We want to make sure that uh, the data is doesn't go in the wrong hands. We want to provide all the hooks in there. And, uh, you know, when people talk about AI, uh, AI has, of course, it has a lot of benefits. But if used the wrong way, that 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 same model could if, if the right governance is not put in place, you could be misusing that data to do things that it was not intended to do. So it is a very right question to ask around data. How do you use the data? Who has access to the data? Both of these questions. And is there bias in, in the way the AI models are operating? In the case of FarmBeats, at Microsoft, we are not the ones owning the data. What we are doing is with, uh, with uh, Azure FarmBeats or other products, it's a product for the other ag tech companies. So we are providing the right hooks in place so that the data can be shared, but it is not us who has access to the data. We are relying on the, 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 the contract between the grower and the 
and the service provider, the ag service provider, uh, as to who has access to that data. But, and we are providing all the hooks so that data can be securely shared among the entities who are involved. But I think this is a very important problem and should be discussed more as to who should have access to the data and not just that, who should, what should be allowed, what operations should be allowed on top of that data uh, is something that should be mandated as well. There are some new works, new work going on on AI fairness, responsible AI and stuff, which are things that should be applied to agriculture as well to make sure that your AI models, they don't have a bias. If they present a result, you should be able to explain why did an AI model do a certain thing. And these are things that need to be put in place. This entire field is, is still uh, very early, very young, and a lot of these, these tools, these infrastructures being put in place. And we should make sure that this is all done for agriculture and food as well. Yeah, I would say the same thing, that there are great principles, right, for the ethical use of data um, and, and the FAIR sort of framework is starting to be applied in the context of agriculture, as Ranveer says. But I think there's a lot of work, unlike, say, health uh, personal data or social media data to be done in thinking about how data gets used, potentially misused, for whose benefit, biases in data sets as they feed into or, or teach um, algorithms. All of that work in agriculture is still pretty new, so this is a great question to ask. And it's an area that I, I work in. And it's not just a sort of social justice issue, but the adopt coming back to Juliana's point about adoption in Canada or, or North America, my work with farmers shows that that concerns around data trust and, and lack of uh, governance uh, infrastructure is actually um, preventing adoption in lots of cases. So it's a thing that needs to be dealt with. One of the mediating um, um, there are some sort of personal organizations that have developed, as Ranveer says, in between service providers and farmers to try to manage data trust, like Ag Data Transparent is one, sort of a certification organization that says to farmers, you can trust this um, agribusiness that they're going to do the right things with your data. But the, we're yet to see the results of that. Yeah, and that's an area of interest to us as well from a policy perspective and, and in talking to Kelly and other academics like Peter Phillips at the University of Saskatchewan. He's sort of helping us out with, with you know, what the current state of play is, what the, the issues are. And, uh, you know, we're talking with the Standards Council of Canada. Uh, they're working on, on that as well, and, and they always are in a position to sort of entertain use cases. So it is an area that we're looking at and it often comes up in the context of parliamentarians. I, I recall the, the common standing committee on on innovation was was dealing with the, the, the right to repair issue and, and that does tend to come up. So it's a, it's an ongoing issue. All right, um, so we are now at 1 p.m. sharp um, I think in the interest of time and uh, I know that people have, um, e even in the pandemic, busy schedules. Um, and so uh, I would like to invite uh, maybe the speakers, maybe if they have one more um, takeaway message that they would like to um, to give to the to the attendees, to the other panelists, and um, then I would give back to Florian. I would just say thank you to my fellow panelists. I, I learned a lot, it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, same here. Thank you for and look forward to working with you all. Yeah. Yeah, and I would like to echo my thanks as well. It's a really exciting area and lots of activity. Even in the last six months, it's really exploded. And uh, that's very encouraging uh, for us and all of us. It gives us things to do. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so now, uh, my turn to thank uh, everybody for the everyone for your presentation today and for the the comments and highlighting also some of the connectivity issues that we have right now <laughs> in Canada. And hopefully that the government of Canada will work on results uh, because as it was uh, highlighted in many of the presentation, for all this we need to have actual connectivity in rural area in northern Canada which is not the case uh, right now. So thank you again, uh, everybody, and I look forward to continuing this conversation as part of the Alex Trebek uh, AN Society uh, virtual talks. Uh, have a nice remaining uh, of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs>